Hello everybody, Ellie here for Who Culture. Now, who here is a little bit like me and is a little bit too nosy for their own good? Especially when it comes to being very curious about how much money famous actors make. You know at the end of the year when you get the list of like the highest paid celebrities in Hollywood? And that got me thinking about Doctor Who actors. So why don't you join me in taking a look at how much some of the show's biggest stars made? And let's kick things off with William Hartnell. So the first Doctor was something of an enigma when he landed on our television screens back in November 1963. We didn't really know who he was, whether he was human, whether he was alien, we didn't even know the name of his home planet. That would all come a lot later in the show. As he tells Ian and Barbara, I don't discuss my private life with strangers, and to be honest, he's probably right about that. Stranger danger and all that. Now, the same was actually quite true for the man who portrayed him, whose starting salary actually was never disclosed. However, according to the 19 1994 First Doctor Handbook, William Hartnell was earning £315 per episode by the end of his run. Now that's nearly £5,000 in today's money. Now it's not an exact science as the First Doctor season could contain anywhere between 39 to 45 episodes. So on average, Hartnell's fee for a season would have been around £13,000, or somewhere in the region of about £200,000 today. And since each season lasted roughly a year, his annual salary would have been about the same. Now that's not a bad start for the show's first leading man, and as we'll see, it's actually not far off his modern day counterparts. So let's move on to the first Doctor companions. Now there's no data available for the show's original companions, so Susan, Ian and Barbara. Though based on what we do know about other actors from that same era, they would have been earning significantly less than the Doctor was. So in a 2021 interview, Stephen actor Peter Purvis, he described the BBC of 1965 as particularly ungenerous, revealing that he was paid just £30 per episode. Now before you go, <gasps> £30? In today's money, that's about £490. Now, Purvis starred in 46 episodes over a one-year period, which gives him an overall figure of about £1,380, so about £22,500 today. Again, the First Doctor Handbook reports that the era's final pair of companions, which was Annika Wills and Michael Craze, they were earning slightly more per episode than Purvis was, at £68 and £52, respectively. Again, today, that's around £1,000 and £800. Pounds. So it's certainly not the most glamorous of paydays, especially by modern standards. But that being said, for all Doctor Who companions, there are two silver linings, residuals and the convention circuit. As Purvis actually puts it, there can't be many people who are still earning a little bit from Doctor Who 50 odd years later. I mean, how many Doctor Who actors do you see turning up at conventions? They're right, there are very few jobs where you can still be earning from a role you played sometimes only in like one or two episodes back in the 60s. It does blow my mind. Okay, so let's go to John Pertwee. Now, in one 1990s interview, John Pertwee actually claimed that he earned about £350 per episode while he was making Doctor Who. If anybody thinks I was making a lot of money, they're crazy, is what he said. That's for a week's work, and I couldn't do anything else. So due to the sharp rise in inflation in the 1970s, the value of his fee actually changed markedly during his time as the Doctor. I mean, £350 in 1970 would be worth about £4,000. £1,600 now, while £350 in 1974 would actually only just be £3,200 now. Either way you look at it though, he's still got less than Hartnell. And furthermore, there were fewer episodes per season by this point. It's good news for the lead actor's schedule, not so great news for his bank account. So for his first season, Pertwee would have received approximately £8,750. So in today's money, that's about £115,000. By his final season, his overall figure would in real terms be worth significantly less. I mean, he would have pulled in around £9,100, which is about £83,000 today. That's a drop of 32 grand from his first season. Now, reportedly, Pertwee also received a 3% pay rise each year. And famously, and not entirely unreasonably given inflation, he said that he'd only continue to do Doctor Who if they increased that to 20%, which of course they refused. So we skipped over to Tom Baker. So inflation continued to plague 
like Doctor Who in the second half of the 1970s as well. And this directly impacted the show's production, with many of the fourth Doctor stories being affected by industrial action. But what of the show's leading man? The ineffable Tom Baker. After all, even if you walk in eternity, you do still have to pay the bills. Baker's Doctor Who salary has never been officially revealed, but no doubt it did drop in value over his seven years at the helm. So if he was being paid the same £350 per episode rate as John Pertwee was, say, his fee would have pretty much halved between 1975 and 1981, so from £2,600 to £1,300 in today's money. Though of course that doesn't account for any of the pay rises. In fact, one early report of Baker's salary was greatly exaggerated, as the man himself was quick to point out. He said, I live very simply. I have hardly any possessions and I live in a bedsit in Pimlico. I read in a national newspaper that I was getting paid £1,000 a week for Doctor Who. That's absolutely preposterous. The BBC must have had a good laugh. Even if Baker's original paychecks were slightly disappointing, that was half a century ago. And Doctor Who, of course, as we know, is the financial gift that keeps on giving, so he's no doubt made quite a lot more since then. Louise Jameson up next, so our next companion is Leela, who joined the Fourth Doctor from 1977 to 1978. Louise Jameson has since revealed that her starting salary was £120 per episode. And by the time she left the show, this had increased to £150. So at first glance, this seems like a significant improvement on the rates received by the previous companions. However, the figures are deceptive. £120 in 1977 would have been worth just £44 in 1967. So in other words, Jameson was valued about the same as a 1960s companion. So across the 40 episodes she appeared in, she would have earned something like £29,000 adjusted for inflation. So that's slightly more than Purvis, slightly less than Wills, and around the same as craze. So it's not the most impressive salary, though it did at least give Jameson a foot in the door at the BBC. She recalled, By the time I got to EastEnders, I was on a pretty reasonable whack. Now there's also been the customary conventions, as we previously mentioned, Big Finish audios and DVD Blu-ray extras. Most recently there was the season 15 collection trailer, The Final Battle, so she's managed to generate additional Who-related income in the interim. And the show also served as a springboard in other ways for her too, with a guest role in Toast of London coming her way purely because the creator Matt Berry liked Leela. So let's skip to Colin Baker. So in a 1987 interview, shortly after his forced exit from Doctor Who, Colin Baker gave a candid interview to The Sun, revealing, among a lot of other things, his pay, stating, I'm by no means a rich man from Doctor Who. I earned around £1,000 an episode. So it's not clear whether Baker is referring to season 22 episodes, which were 45 minutes in length, or season 23 episodes, which were 25 minutes in length. Regardless though, at £1,000 an episode, he would have made £13,000 for season 22 and £14,000 for season 23. Respectively, that's around £38,000 and £40,000 today. A meagre sum for the star of one of the biggest shows in the world, even if it was on the ropes at that point. Now, the Sixth Doctor also had a much shorter era than almost any other Doctor, so whichever way you look at it, Colin Baker came away with much less than his predecessors. I guess then maybe we should be thanking God for the renaissance that old Sixie has experienced in recent years. Look at it this way, it's no coincidence that convention rhymes with pension. Hey, see what I did there? Okay, now let's jump forward to Christopher Eccleston. So we're going to fast forward all the way to 2005. Bringing Doctor Who back was a massive risk for the BBC. They knew if it was going to stand any chance of being successful and being taken seriously, then it needed to be fronted by a truly great actor. And Christopher Eccleston fit the bill in every conceivable way. But he did come at a cost. So according to one report from The Standard, Eccleston's single year on the show left him a whopping £600,000 better off. In 2024, that's over a million pounds, which is an extremely impressive salary considering the revival was far from a safe bet. Now, of course, he did leave Doctor Who prematurely, in exceptional circumstances. So, assuming that that figure is accurate, it might refer to a contract for multiple series rather than just series one. Perhaps three series at £200,000 each, maybe? But even then, that would be almost £350,000 per year in 2024, which is not too shabby either way. Billy Piper. 
Knight's doctor companion Rose Tyler lived on a council estate and lost her job shortly after meeting the Time Lord. But the reality for the actress playing her, Billy Piper, was quite different. Now, we don't know how much Piper earned for her work on Series 1, though it would be reasonable to assume that it wasn't quite as much as her co-star, regardless of how much he really earned. However, the fee for her second run of episodes has been reported, with the people claiming it was £210,000. In today's money, that's £350,000. That's around 10 times the salary of the average classic series companion. And wait, because that is not all. If this report is to be believed, then Piper received around £50,000 more than new Dr. David Tennant for the 2006 series, which is possibly the first time in history that a companion was paid more than the Doctor. It's great news that Billy is staying, a source was quoted as saying. Her deal is what she deserves, as she's a favourite with fans. Now, if all this is true, you can see the logic in paying Piper more than Tennant at this stage. I mean, she was a proven draw as Rose, not to mention her successful music career. And after the Eccleston drama, it was probably quite important to keep her around and also to keep her happy. Tennant, though a proven actor in his own right before he played the Doctor, would have to prove he was worth a bumper Doctor Who payday. And uh, that is exactly what he did. So let's look at David Tennant. Doctor Who's mainstream popularity peaked when David Tennant played the 10th Doctor. So really it should come as no surprise that his salary is, out of all of the Doctors, the most speculated about. This was a Doctor who was unable to lend Donna money without raiding an ATM, yet also managed to procure her a winning lottery ticket. But what of the man himself? Well, as discussed, Tennant was apparently paid less for Series 2 than Billy Piper, taking home £166,000 to her £210,000. The same report claims that Tennant signed a three-year contract for £500,000, which is roughly £166,000 a year. In today's money, that would be £275,000 annually. But the final word goes to the rap, which suggests that Tennant ended up receiving a staggering one million dollars per year. I mean, that sounds more realistic for the latter stages of his run when his value was undeniable. No wonder the money in The Runaway Bride had Tennant's face printed all over it. That's a lot of money. So then we went to Matt Smith. Now, the 11th Doctor was one of the few Doctors to actually get a job. Remember in the toy department of Colchester, Sanderson and Granger? And as he explains to Craig, saw a shop, got a job, you've got to live in the moment. Now, however good the pay at Sanderson and Granger was, we're fairly sure it wasn't as good as what Matt Smith was earning in real life. So according to reports at the time, Smith's original contract committed him to three years on the show with an option for two more. And the overall fee was one million pounds, working out at £200,000 a year. Now, of course, Matt Smith only ended up completing three series of the show. So in that case, he would have walked away with a total of £600,000, which would be about £890,000 today. Yowza. If the one million figure for Tennant is correct, the 11th Doctor's basic earnings were only a fraction of tens. By those metrics, Tennant earned more in a single year than Smith did overall. And then we saw Peter Capaldi. So the 12th Doctor was supposedly still on the unit payroll as of Death in Heaven, and later he held down a job at St. Luke's University. Now it's not clear how much he earned from either of those endeavours, but when it comes to the man who played him, things are a little bit clearer. And that's because Capaldi is one of the only Doctors to have his salary publicly revealed by the BBC. Now that wasn't because of Capaldi himself, it was because of the 2017 policy which required the corporation to declare its highest earning stars. Basically anyone earning more than £150,000. Now the exact pay packet that Capaldi received that year is unknown, but we do know that it was somewhere in the £200,000 to £249,999 bracket. That was a lot of nines. So if you want a bit of context, EastEnders star Danny Dyer and Silent Witness star Amelia Fox, they both earned a similar amount, while Casualty's Derek Thompson was on over £100,000 more. Topping the talent list was presenter Chris Evans, who brought in over £2 million. That quarter of a million fee would basically cover Capaldi's work on Series 10, and it's not clear whether he was paid the same for Series 8 and Series 9, though it probably would seem quite likely. So let's move over to Jodie Whittaker. The BBC no longer has to include actors in its list of highest paid earners, so the exact amount received by the 14th and the 15th Doctors will forever remain a mystery. 
But thanks to a quirk of timing, we do have some idea about Jodie Whittaker's starting salary. Now, the report that revealed Peter Capaldi's earnings came just days after Whittaker's casting was announced, and that prompted speculation about whether or not the show's first female doctor would receive more or less than her male predecessors. And the BBC Director General Tony Hall soon put those rumours to rest, and he confirmed that the 13th Doctor would be paid the same amount as the 12th. So this means that, at least to begin with, Whittaker was also in that £200,000 to £249,999 bracket. Now obviously with Disney now partnering on the show and bigger budgets than we've ever seen, we might speculate that the current Doctor, Shuti Gatwa, is earning more than any of these Doctors before him. But still, a quarter of a million basic salary per year for Capaldi and Whittaker is nothing to sneeze at. And there you have it. So now we know how much these actors were earning once they were in the role. But is anyone curious about how they got cast in the first place? Well, fear not, because we have a video covering just that. So why not check out how every Doctor got cast? In the meantime, I've been Ellie for Who Culture, and in the words of Riversong herself, goodbye, sweeties.